Hello, my name is Simon Double and welcome to Inside the Rails, a podcast for lovers of horse racing. It gives me great pleasure. I'm joined by my old mate, Phil Boyle. Hi, Phil. Hi, Simon. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm not bad. Not bad. It's a beautiful morning down here in Berkhamsted, Hertfordshire. What's it like down your Dorking, Surrey, aren't you? What's it like down there? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a nice morning. Uh, we haven't got many leaves on the trees anymore, but the sun's shining and it was uh, nice enough weather that my wife went out for a walk this morning. So, um, yeah. Yeah, very nice. Uh, wish we could uh, go out and stand on the gallops on a morning like this, but uh, we'll have that to look forward to next month. I suppose, really, we ought to, why why do we decide? You actually approached me, really, about this. Well, why are we, why are we doing this? Re- remind me. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope you'd know. Uh, yeah, well, we just, we, we've always sort of been passionate about racehorse ownership and getting more people involved in it. I know we've had many conversations about it in the past, and I, I thought it might be quite fun to start a podcast to try and promote that a little bit wider, um, try and tell people a bit more about it. We're both lucky enough to run racehorse ownership groups we're we're members of the committee of the racehorse syndicates association which is obviously where we met about 18 months ago and um yeah i think it, it it's it's something we're both really keen on really passionate about and it's a platform that the rsa has kindly provided us with to uh, share that with people so great well i'm, I'm glad you've refreshed my memory no i'm joking of course i know why I'm doing. <laughs> but um uh, to, yeah we the, the plan is to try and do this a series of monthly podcasts and give people a little bit of light relief in these quite troubled and difficult times so just take people's minds off the pandemic and lockdown and, and talk about something really exciting like horse racing. We've got, obviously, the end of the flat season finished last weekend and we're moving into the national hunt. Uh, I think you're involved in both, aren't you, Phil? Yeah, we've got um, we've got one flat horse and a couple of jumpers. I, I'm probably, uh, uh, unlike you, I, I know your first love's the flat, my first love's the jump, so hopefully that'll uh, synchronise pretty well. Um, I really enjoy the flat season, but... I've been an annual member at Cheltenham for many years, and so uh, probably the jumps is my first love. So, uh, yeah, hopefully a good balance between us. Now, Phil, we, we've known each other all oh, about a year because we sit on the committee of the RSA, which is the Race or Syndicates Association. For, for those who don't know, it's the main body that represents uh, racing syndicates and clubs throughout the country and, and promotes ownership, particularly syndicates and, and, and clubs. And uh, And I know that your background, I think it still is, is pensions, but... That burning question, how did you actually first get into racing, Phil? What was it that got you the bug? If I had to, if I had to blame anybody for uh, my involvement in racehorses, it, it would probably be my friend's dad. Me and my best mate, Tony, used to go to Fulham every home game. His, his dad, Richard, used to take us up to Craven Cottage. And obviously, there's only home games uh, every other Saturday. So on the Saturdays in between, we'd be hanging out at Tony's house. And Richard enjoyed the races, and he would always pop round to Peter's Racing, the local independent bookie, and put a few bets on and watch the racing on Grandstand or World of Sport or whatever it was back then, and we'd sit with him and watch it. And I I think I caught the bug from there. I became an annual member at Sandown and then at Cheltenham a little bit later on and and then always fancied getting involved in ownership somewhere down the line and um, eventually sort of bought a small share of a horse up in, in Middleham in Yorkshire, which was which was great, but it was a long way from home. Always thought we might do it ourselves at some point in the future. Uh, and uh, yeah, a few years ago, got the opportunity to, well, probably 10 years ago now, got the opportunity to go to a local yard where a good friend of mine now, Alan Fleming, was training. He had a, a nice horse called Starluck back then that was running in a Triumph Hurdle at Cheltenham. And I, I managed to blag myself a, a yard visit to go over and uh, and see the horses on the gallops and like so many people that go and visit yards and stables in the mornings, you know, you, you really do sort of get the bug when you go and do that because you really feel right on the inside. And, and I took my wife with me and despite lecturing me all the way over that we weren't there to buy a horse, <laughs> uh, we probably only got about a quarter of the way back. And she said to me, oh, that's brilliant. Now we're going to have to buy a horse, which uh, obviously my arm didn't need to be twisted too much. So so yeah, that's where we are. That was about ten years ago, and I've been involved in ownership ever since. Yeah, and how about yourself? Where did where did the uh, Solario racing story start? So a bit like you, no background, no family background in in racing in terms of you know father wasn't a trainer or a breeder or anything like that. But it was the late eighties. I was going out with a young lady, and she was quite horsey, not particularly into horse racing. 
once once a year the grand national comes around and we were going we happened to be going around to my mother's for lunch and he said look it's grand national weekend uh, there needs to be a bookmaker so i can go and put two or three bets on i thought fine so I think it was the year Rhyme and Reason ones. It must be 1988. You're more of a, a jumps man than me, but it sounds about right, doesn't it? I think Rhyme and Reason, 1988. It does. It's Yeah, I'm not I'm not good on the years, but it sounds about the right sort of era. Anyway, she, she cut a long story short, she had, she had two or three bets. She won, got horses placed. I didn't do anything. But on the Monday, we were both driving to work together. Sometimes she drove, sometimes I did. And, and Radio 4 was on, and... I think they still do this. They, they had their daily double. This is amazing. I can remember the two horses they picked out. It was Lapierre and Media Star Guest. And I was working in marketing at the time up in London. I went down to a local Ladbrokes, put a couple of bets on. It shows you how naive I was because I did them both. It was literally two quid each way, I think. And one was like a five to four shot. So it shows you how much I knew about odds and racing. Anyway, they both won. And, of course, that was the slippery slope, wasn't it? We started going racing, went to Newmarket, went to Windsor on a Monday night. And I can remember religiously following Pat, almost blindly, Pat Edry. You know, I mean, he was, just a, he, he was known as a god in a weighing room, but he was certainly a god on Monday nights at Windsor. They had trebles and four-timers loads of times. And, and I really got the bug of the racing industry. Went to, went to uh, Newmarket, and I think it was the 2000 Guineas at Doyoon won that year. And then I thought I'd, I'd quite like to get into this, into this industry. And I used to take the Racing Post and I saw a very small box ad in there. Uh, and it said the winning formula. And it was Peter Harris. And I remember there were just three questions that it asked. Uh, it said, are you sociable? Do you mind working antisocial hours? And do you enjoy horse racing? And I thought, well, I pretty much ticked those three boxes. Uh, did a little bit of research and suddenly realised that quite a few of the horses that Peter Harris was training were syndicates, which at those times, late eighties, nineties, was was sort of fairly, fairly new. For, they were fairly thin on the, on the ground. Anyway, a couple of interviews later, I got this job. I thought it was going to be looking after owners, but it was actually selling shares. And I was there nine years. So from ninety four to two thousand and three, that was my very first job. Was selling shares with other partnership managers. And Peter Harris was was a big influence on me, and really a, a major influence on in racing, really, and 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 syndication. Have, have you heard of him? Heard, heard of Peter Harris? He doesn't train anymore, but you might know the name. Yeah, I know, I know the name, but uh, never come across him. I, I kind of wasn't involved sort of back when he was involved in racing, but um, but yeah, interesting story. There you go. There's uh, there's all sorts of channels into the industry, but I mean, I think the one thing we both share, isn't it, is is that just how much fun sort of i mean we talk about syndicates but i mean we probably haven't explained what a syndicate is i mean in case anybody that's listening doesn't know it's it's really just shared ownership isn't it getting a group of people together to share the costs of owning a horse and um and it's a you know it's brilliant i mean i, I you know we can't all be fortunate enough to to uh, have enough money to be able to pay the training fees for a whole horse of ourselves but Arguably, I think sharing it with a group of like-minded individuals is is even more rewarding because it gives you a bunch of friends to chat to about it, doesn't it? Well, that, well, that's right. I mean, I mentioned the RSA, and again, it's the Racehorse Syndicates Association, who who now represent a, a lot of uh, big organisations, Midland Park, High Clear. I think we've now got seventy nine members, which is which is great. And uh, you run BG Racing, and just tell me, obviously, there's there's lots of different models, aren't there? There's there's people who own twelve shares, which is the sort of model I have with Solaria Racing. There are big racing clubs. Just tell me a little bit about BG Racing. What sort of, you know, do you have lots of owners, quite small numbers? Just just give, give us a flavour for, for how that works. Yeah, I could, I could have 100 owners in each horse if um, if if I sold 100 1% shares because I sell them in, in 1% units and upwards. I mean, the reality is, is I, I have different size shareholders. So I have a few people that just buy 1% of a horse and I have a few people that might want... 10% of a horse or even more. But yeah, you're right. There's there's so many different uh, opportunities at, at different sort of uh, levels of investment and size of shareholding. You know, obviously, uh, a lot of people talk about owning a leg of a horse, which, you know, typically means having a quarter of it, obviously. Uh, and, you know, that would be quite expensive, wouldn't it? You know, but, but you know, there are there are syndicates out there that they divide the horse into 3,000 shares, you know, as well as people like me that does 100 and people like yourself that does 12. So hopefully there's something there for everybody, really. 
Yeah, it's quite funny you mentioned about the legs because I did a, a little interview with somebody the other day and I do quite a bit of networking, which I think you do as well, don't you? Um, and uh, people are always surprised when I say I'm a race or syndicator. They have no idea what that is because quite often people are solicitors and accountants and that sort of thing. Of course, sadly, none of us have been doing much live networking. We're all zoomed out at the moment. But uh, but when I have done networking, people are always quite surprised. And I say, and they say, well, what's that? I said, well, you've heard of this phrase and you used it, didn't you? About owning, you know, you know someone down the pub who's got a leg and a horse. And, and I've used this phrase, well, you know, my horses have four legs. Sometimes they have 12. <laughs> and, and, they, and there's this big pause and they look at me and I said we're not really I'm joking I think they think I've got these genetically modified horses that have got 12 legs but but that is that is quite often an industry standard the 12 shares and that was certainly something that Peter Harris pioneered and concentrated on I mean I tend to do 12 shares and quarter shares with Solaria Racing Phil one of the questions I get I was two questions really when I do sort of lots of networking is is what's sort of typical profile of, of an owner of a syndicate member and the other thing is, what is it that attracts them? I know whenever I get asked, you know, I know you're in pensions. People say, oh, what's the return on investment? And I always go, whoa, oh, so I'm not sure you should necessarily be doing it. That shouldn't be your, your, your main reason for doing it. But but in terms of what, what are your thoughts on that in terms of profile of the owner? And also, what are they looking to get out of, you know, being in a syndicate? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd be the same as you. Uh, I, I steer away from using the word investment because... Uh, that kind of implies a positive return, and of course, uh, you know, some of, sometimes we're lucky enough to own a horse that pays its way and, and earns a bit of prize money, and the, and the shareholders benefit from that. But you know, there's a there, for for every successful horse, there'll probably be one that that proves to be not quite up to the level that uh, that you were maybe hoping when you got involved. But that doesn't mean that the experience is any the less. And I, and I will always talk to people about the experience. Um, I play a lot of golf and I, I talk to a lot of golfers about this. And I, I kind of, I, I, it's partly responsible for the name of this podcast. We call this Inside the Rails. Well, a, a golfing terminology, that's inside the ropes. You know, they put the ropes down the side of the fairway. And obviously the people that are inside the ropes that are on the fairway or walking along, you know, chatting to the caddies or the players or people like that, they're, they're inside the ropes. And and I think that racehorse ownership gets you inside the rails. Uh, if you're a person that's ever enjoyed a, a day at the races, I mean, you look on the outside of the paddock at all those people standing in the middle pre-race having a chat to the trainers and a chat to the jockeys. Well, that can be you even if you're a really small shareholder. Uh, you know, And on top of that, you're in the owners and trainers bar and maybe there's a bit of food provided. And it's, it's that kind of VIP experience that I think shouldn't be underestimated. And away from the races, like I said before, you know, a morning at the stables where you're standing looking at all the horses Horses with the trainer. The trainer's telling you a bit about what's going on. You, you know, you can you can sit with the trainer and have a cup of coffee or a bit of breakfast. And you know, those kind of experiences are that genuinely those. In a lot of cases, their money can't buy. You know, if you ever went to an auction and said, "Well, you can have a morning on the gallops with X trainer," people might pay several hundred pounds for that. Well, they could buy a small share of a horse, and they could do it three or four times a year. You know, it's that kind of. VIP experience is really what I sell it on. Yeah, and, and I'd agree with you. That thing, particularly about going around the stables, I've, I've, uh, I did quite a lot of hospitality events. So last year, uh, obviously not able to do it this year, but last year did a trip to the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Only about eight of us went. I go to Newbury a couple of times a year, so I quite often like to do events when actually I haven't got a horse running, so there's no pressure. Now, of course. <laughs> this has all been very difficult this year, hasn't it, um, with COVID? And, and I know we, do, we, you know, people want a bit of light relief from lockdown and pandemic. I think we've got to touch upon it really, just because from your point of view and mine, running syndicates, BG Racing, Solaria Racing, and, and High Clear, and all, all of those, all those syndicators, will have, it'll have been a quite a tough job, wouldn't it? Actually trying to keep owners engaged. How, how have you found it, Phil? Yeah, I think um, I, you know I've been I, I'm lucky that I've got. Uh, you know, I, I consider most of my my sort of owners as as friends, and they've been very patient, etc. But you know, I mean, it's just not been the experience we've wanted to offer this year, has it? I mean, you know, we got owners back on the race course reasonably quickly, and and I, I thought that wasn't too bad. Was it two and a half months? Was it? I think... It wasn't long after racing restarted that we had owners back there, which which is great. But 
you know, whereas I'm sure you're the same as me, you, you'd hope to be able that, 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 you know, most of the race courses will work with us to, to give us as many badges as they can spare so that we can get as many people into that owner's experience as possible. But obviously with group sizes being restricted, I mean, there was no way we were ever going to get, you know, more than sort of 